This week on Quadriga. Paris Massacre. Freedom under attack. It is the deadliest terror attack in France for decades. Black-clad gunmen opened fire at the Paris offices of satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo. Reports said they were shouting Allahu Akbar. French authorities declared the highest terror threat level for Paris. President Hollande described it as an attack against free speech and said the assailants must be brought to justice. Charlie Hebdo has repeatedly published provocative caricatures, including of the Prophet Mohammed. Its editor-in-chief, who was among the dead, had received death threats. Is Europe facing a new level of terrorism following the growth of Islamist violence in the Middle East? And should an attack like this prompt a fresh look at the limits of free speech? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Europe has seen its worst terrorist attack since the London bombings of 2005. Who's behind the violence? What does it signal and how should France and Europe respond? That's what we want to talk about today with our three guests. It's a pleasure to welcome Geraldine Schwartz. She is a French TV journalist based in Berlin, covering international news, German affairs, and cultural matters for the French-German public TV channel Arte. And she has also worked for the news agencies Agence France Presse and Bloomberg. And a pleasure to welcome Martina Sabra. She has worked as a journalist for more than 20 years in the Middle East and North Africa. She's an expert on Islam and also writes on migration, democratic development, and human rights. And it's a pleasure to have with us once again Michel Ludas. He's an author and political advisor with extensive experience in the Middle East, including as correspondent for the German newspaper Die Zeit. His works include documentaries for German public television and both non-fiction and fiction on Middle Eastern topics. Let us start out by reviewing what we know so far about the perpetrators. The youngest one, Hamid Murad, apparently has given himself up. And as of this moment, the other two are still at large. They are Saeed and Sherif Kouachi, born in Paris, orphaned, and Sherif at least clearly already known to the French authorities. Geraldine Schwartz, what more can you tell us? Um, yes, Sherif, um, 10 years ago, uh, was sentenced because he was suspected to recruit uh, young jihadists in France to send them to uh, Iraq. And he himself, he tried to go to Iraq to make a jihad. Um, but I think one question which is really important right now in France is, um, did, is this an Islam, Islamic terrorist attack? Um, these uh, three gunmen, when they appeared uh, in the, at the beginning of the attack uh, on Wednesday, claimed that they were actually from Al-Qaeda. And when they escaped from the building, uh, journalists uh, heard them saying, uh, Alu Akbar, which means God is great, uh, we avenged uh, Mahomet, uh, Charlie Hebdo is dead. Right. Um, what do you make of the fact that they had such military expertise? Apparently, they had, were very adept at using their weapons. The attack appears to be very well planned. Does that indicate for you that they must have had some kind of military experience? Uh, well, I think it's a bit too soon to make any statements on that, but there is a clear difference with um, other accidents uh, which happened uh, in, the, in the last weeks, uh, like uh, a man who drove his car in a crowd in Dijon, uh, who clearly was psychologically uh, a bit disabled, then another man a few weeks ago who stabbed uh, three policemen in a police station also shouting Alu Akbar. Now we, we are facing a, a new situation. Clearly these three guys in five minutes managed to get in in a protected building um, and knew exactly that on Wednesday, Wednesday the most important day for the paper, uh, and they came in the middle of an editor meeting and they knew exactly who they were targeting, who are the most important figures of the newspaper. 
The other attacks that uh, Geraldine Schwartz just mentioned, Michael Ludos, are sometimes referred to as lone wolf attacks. They're also the kind of attacks we've seen in Canada, in Australia. This one appears to be quite different. It does appear to be very meticulously planned, and there's been a lot of commentary by experts saying it looks like they had received some kind of training. Would you say that points to an Al-Qaeda connection, in fact? Well, it's interesting to note that at least until now, there has been no claim by Al-Qaeda or by the Islamic State uh, that they are involved in this terrorist attack. But nevertheless, these individuals who are responsible for the massacre might be affiliated to this group or at least ideologically close. Uh, we don't know the details yet, but indeed it is a new quality. These lone wolves attacked in the past, it's one thing, but these people were not necessarily lone wolves. It's a it appears to be a group of people that were involved and they were indeed planning this attack meticulously over a lengthy period of time. They were very professional in their ongoing and also they had the right weapons to commit such a crime and uh, you don't get these weapon right around the corner. So there must have been some professional training in the background, and there must have been a good connections to those people who are able to deliver such weapons. I think in France, people are very worried, the security apparatus as well, what's happening in the, in the, in the backyard of, of, uh, of France, so to speak, because this is really a new quality, and I think this is not the last attack of this kind that we are going to see. Geraldine Schwartz, you wanted to add something? Yes, the um, editor uh, of the paper who was killed, uh, Charbe, uh, Stéphane Charbonnier, was actually on a list uh, released uh, on a magazine, internet magazine of Al-Qaeda, so uh, to be shortlist. So even if it hasn't been claimed, uh, they were inspired, Absolutely. obviously, yeah. by this list. Martina Sabra, there's been a lot of concern throughout Europe about the possibility of homegrown terrorism, fomented in particular by people who perhaps had gone off to fight in Iraq or Syria and then returned. The irony here is that it sounds like Sharif never even got to the Middle East, that he was radicalized right at home. Yeah, this exactly fits into a pattern which has been explained recently and recently uh, experts have started warning um, uh, of this. They, there have been uh, warnings all the time, like for example experts like a Professor Dr. Peter Neumann from London, from King's College, who is an uh, internationally renowned expert on, uh, on Salafism and Jihadism. He exactly warned of what has happened now. It's like, it's like a prophecy which has been fulfilled, that um, there seems to be a shift we still don't know, I mean, we really have to underline this, we still don't know whether there has effectively been a Qaeda link or not. Maybe this will, and there, there has been no confession up to now, but there seems to be a shift in pattern of attacks. Like before, we used to expect um, big attacks, large scale attacks, with a maximum amount of victims, for example, like the one we saw in Spain more than 10 years ago, the, the big attack on the train by the Moroccan main, uh, where more than 200 people died, or the, the one in London with more than 50 uh, people dead. Now it seems that there is a shift to more um, small scale attacks, but with a very high symbolic value. And this has been predicted actually uh, during the last months and during the last year. And it has also been predicted by experts that um, homegrown uh, jihadists and Islamists would pose uh, an, a, a, a greater uh, threat than before. But it, we still don't know. It is probable, it is possible that one of one member of this group, and we still don't know how big the group is as a whole, has been trained effectively, um, maybe in an Arab country or in another country. But they may also have been trained militarily in France or in Europe. We don't know this. So what then is the link to the fact that France, for example, is supporting the U.S. campaign of bombings against ISIS in the Middle East? What has been the French Muslim community's reaction, for example, to that, uh, Géraldine Schwartz? Um, well, I mean, the French Muslim population in France is quite big. It's uh, almost five million Muslims, that's more than Germany, the double th from the UK. Uh, so, and it, it is a population which uh, has always had 
struggles and conflicts with French because of the past colonial times. Uh, so they have really, they know, they feel that they really have to react in a very clear way. And that's actually what they did yesterday, posting on social uh, medias, uh, uh, condemning the attacks very clearly. This is, uh, but also, I mean, like, you can't avoid that on um, these kind of attacks, there are some isolated reactions on the social networks which will praise the attacks. This happens too. Michel Luders, the uh, Front National, the right-wing party in France that has been growing uh, and uh, increasing uh, its strength in the polls, it has said since the ISIS campaign began, look, we shouldn't get mixed up in this. It will increase the threat of violence at home. Would you say these at this attack bears that out? I don't really see a connection between this deed that we have seen and uh, what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, that might be uh, two different stories. But nevertheless, the Front National is, of course, uh, the big winner of yesterday, of the event that we have seen in, in Paris, because very many people in France they are very worried and they are fearful, and they will vote for the Front National during the next elections. I'm quite positive about that. So I'm pretty sure that they are jubilant and that they open quite a few bottles of champagne. And uh, unfortunately, this attack will add to Islamophobia that is already very strong in Europe, not only in France, also in Germany and other parts of Europe. The extreme right in Germany and also the populists from the right specter, they of course see Islam as, a, as an ideal scapegoat for all things that are going wrong in Europe in terms of immigration, in terms of economic woes, in terms of societal gaps, whatever you want to see as a problem. For their, from their point of view, it's Islam that is responsible. And of course, these people, they would say, we have always told you that Islam is a terrorist religion, and now we have another proof. So the extremists from both sides, they will feel encouraged, and they will add fuel to their uh, commitments. Yes, I mean, I do think that there is a, a link between what happened and the tensions in France and the fact that France is actually involved uh, not only uh, against the Islamic State, it's one, one of the first countries who uh, actually joined the US in the airstrikes there, and it was in Mali fighting against Islamists. And in Libya, uh, in Libya yeah. it banned uh, the, the headscarf. I mean, it always had quite a clear position uh, with Islam, which uh, explains that there are, I think, more tensions than in Germany, for example. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this might happen in Germany as well, because, I mean, there is this new party, Alternative für Deutschland, which seems to be close to the anti-Muslim anti or anti the so-called so, um, anti-Islamization movement, PEGIDA, um, Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamization of, of Europe. Um, but I think that also many people yesterday felt that it was sort of outrageous because one of the main representatives of the PEGIDA, the anti-Muslim movement in Germany, let's say, let's put it like this, um, they tried to, to capitalize immediately on what happened. And I think that many people understood the game. They really yeah. understood the game and they felt really outraged by Which... this because, in my opinion, this is outrageous um, to, use, um, to use this... This, this horrible massacre for political reasons to try to instrumentalize it on the same evening is a bit, is a, it goes a bit too far, in my opinion. Interestingly enough, the Front National was a bit wiser there. They, in yes. fact, simply uh, issued their grief and condolences to the victims. But I would like to come back later to the larger European uh, issues. Let us now take a look more closely at France. France does have the largest Muslim population in Europe, and it has, as you mentioned, seen Islamist violence in the past. Let's take a brief look at some of those incidents. It's not the first time that France has faced severe terror attacks. In the 1990s, the group Islamic Armée struck repeatedly, including at a Jewish school in Lyon. In 1995 alone, the group killed eight people and injured 200. In March 2012, Mohamed Mera went on a murder spree. A Frenchman with Algerian roots, Mera struck victims in southern France over several days. He shot dead three French soldiers, then attacked a Jewish school. A rabbi and three children were killed. A May 2014 attack on Brussels' Jewish Museum was also traced back to France. An armed French Algerian had stormed the museum lobby and opened fire. Four people were killed.
Geraldine Schwartz, last week in his address at the end of the year, the end of 2014, President François Hollande said that he was very concerned about the rising threat of terrorist attacks. Eighty percent of French people said in polls prior to this attack that they were worried. Did your country take adequate precautions? I should ask the Secret Services. Um, um, I think the attack of Wednesday just suddenly, I mean, the, the country is waking up, you know. I don't think that the people realized that this could happen on their ground so, so rapidly. Uh, because they have been threat before against France. I mean, it's been a long time that they have been threat and nothing had happened, really, uh, which you could qualify as a, as a terrorist attack, organized terrorist attack. Uh, but uh, I, I just would like to come back to what you said at the beginning, is this new quality of a terror attack which targets people who are so famous in France, everybody can identify with them, you know. It's not the same as what was shown uh, earlier. Uh, it's, it's, it's not anonym persons. It's people that have make, made us laugh for 50 years. So everybody, every generation is actually mourning today. And this is a very new quality of attack. Last month, uh, Michel Luders, after those lone wolf attacks in Dijon or Nantes uh, that were um, uh, mentioned earlier by drivers who drove their vehicles into crowds of people also shouting Islamist statements, last month the Prime Minister of France did order additional security and military personnel onto the streets. Can a democracy adequately take precautions against this kind of terrorism? Would you say that there were security deficits here? Or is this simply, simply a risk we must face? I think indeed this is a risk we, we have to face in a democratic open society. There is no way that you can secure a city like Paris or, or like Berlin with millions of, of residents. Of course, police was present in Paris and, and military personnel as well. But these people who attacked and killed so many people, they were ruthless. They knew exactly what they, what they wanted. And uh, they attacked and they were successful because you cannot simply control the whole city. This might happen anywhere. Uh, once you have a, a couple of people who are really you know, decisive in their action and they know exactly what they want, destruction, it's very difficult for state authorities to uh, take the Boston Marathon uh, two years ago. I mean, there is no absolute security. And the security measures in the United States are very high, in France as well, in Germany too. I mean, the security services, they are doing their, their, their work. But still, you can't control millions of people. So we have to live with this risk. This is part of the reality of our modern life. It's, it's part of, of our risk, if you wish, like you know, taking a plane and this plane might, might fall down. We don't hope so. But it might happen. So there is no absolute guarantee. This is part of our reality. I'm only worried that this new quality will also add to new violence, as I mentioned before, from the other side, from the ultra right wings. And I'm afraid, right wingers, and I'm afraid that we see ongoing escalation between these radical Muslims on the one hand and radical um, ultra rightists on the other hand. And I don't know where this, where this is going to, to lead to. Let us assume that in France or elsewhere, some uh, Islam haters. They, they try to torch mosques or they, they attack Muslims or kill Muslims. Well, it's tit for tat killings then, and where does this end? Martina Sabra, security is one side, and clearly there's a very difficult balance there in terms of not moving too far toward a police state. The other side is intelligence. You mentioned earlier threats from the Islamic community in France, have been, Islamist community, have been known for a long time. Would you suppose there may have been intelligence deficits here? Should the authorities have known more about the kind of circles that clearly these young men were moving in? Again, I think this is a question for the, um, to ask the, really, the secret services. Um, I think it has become much more difficult as a task. Um, because there is a lot of what, they, what, what um, uh, security experts call self-radicalization mm -hmm. and the radicalization at home which means that um, even a, an individual person does not even meet other people anymore. So there, is no, there are no groups whom you could infiltrate. So you really need a, a, a large scale uh, surveillance of, of, um, of computers. Of, and this, you don't want this. You, know, you don't want a police state where every single computer is being, um, is being controlled by, by, by the secret services. And this is a problem. It is also difficult to infiltrate the groups 
much more difficult than, than before to infiltrate these groups. But on the other hand, I think, yes, probably there could be more money invested in certain kinds of research. I mean, in certain kinds of, um, for example, do we really need this, this large-scale collection of data? which we can never really exploit. Mm. Should there be more investment, more money going into certain methods of, of, of research um, for, for the services? So probably, but this is difficult for me to judge. What I know is that it has become very difficult. But I would also like to point to another problem. We have a problem with the secret services who do not work perfectly, especially on the right side. Mm. There, there have been killings for 10 years in Germany and our secret services from the right wing mm. groups and our secret services did not really um, persecute these, these groups. Um, we still don't know exactly what has happened and we, st we now start to, to see as well that there might have been many more killings, even not, not only 100 over a period of 10 years, but maybe 900, because we also had a problem of classification. We have a problem of classification of certain crimes, of, um, of uh, systematization, for example, of data collecting, etc. There are certain problems and I do not know personally to which extent these um, apply as well to, the, to combating Islamist extremism. We know that there are problems in combating right-wing extremism. Mm -hmm. Michel mm -hmm. Ludo's self-radicalization, mm -hmm. could that explain part of the connection to the ISIS uh, combat? The fact that they apparently are putting very sophisticated mm -hmm. material on the internet, mm -hmm. Twitter uh, and so on, all used with great effectiveness mm -hmm. by the new Islamist radicals. Mm -hmm. Would you suppose that self-radicalization is increasing increasing because of that kind of uh, uh, the availability of those media? Yes, I would think so indeed. Self-radicalization is a very important keyword because there is lots of frustration among Muslims in Europe for various reasons and very many people they feel inferior, they don't feel part of society for whatever reasons, uh, they blame society in general, not themselves necessarily, but they see themselves as strangers in their own country so to speak because these radical Muslims they are in, in most cases citizens of, of France or of Germany or any other country here in Europe. But there is a small fringe of people who do not identify with what people normally refer to as European or Western values. And these people, they indeed, they, they enjoy the internet, they, they, they do get radicalized by, you know, clicking onto certain uh, contents. And the Islamic State, for instance, is, is very good in making propaganda. They have an excellent propaganda service, so to speak. And yes, this is very appealing to, to, to young, disoriented Muslims in France and elsewhere who go to Iraq, to Syria or elsewhere, or who might, you know, get the idea to stage attacks in Europe. So that is indeed worrying. It is also worrisome for the security agencies because they don't know how to combat this. You cannot control each and every computer. I mean, some security agencies in the US and elsewhere are trying to do so, but still they fail to, to realize immediate dangers as happened in Boston, as happened in, in, in Paris right now. So the human factor remains. There is no absolute security. We will see more of that. In fact, Sherif Kouachi uh, apparently said after he was arrested and imprisoned uh, in 2005, uh, Geraldine Schwartz, that he was glad he had been imprisoned because it took him away from what was a very dangerous path. Yet, he was re-radicalized, obviously, in recent years. Well, maybe it was only a trick, you know, I don't know when he said that. Um, uh, but um, France is, is the source of the biggest numbers of uh, young people going to the jihad in the Middle East, uh, in all Europe. I saw numbers uh, up to a thousand, apparently. Yes, yes, it's, it's really the, the, the biggest number. And um, I mean, there are not only uh, Muslims born or from like Muslim origin, but there are also many convertites. So the problem is, the question is, is are we facing a problem of integration of Muslims or are we facing a problem of youth, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and, and so here again, I mean, you cannot control, you were asking if the security service, secret, secret service uh, did fail. I mean, you cannot control every single young person. You don't know what's going to happen in his head. Maybe he wants to go in a coffee with, with a knife and kill everybody. 
uh, in a very spontaneous way. So this is also the new quality of, uh, of terror, which is even more frightening than organized terror, because I think organized terror can uh, be, uh, um, how do you say, the secret services can maybe follow and, and have some indices for uh, organized terror, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but not for this kind of spontaneous, maybe it was spontaneous, kind of spontaneous, oh, the terrorists today. And atomized. Um, you mentioned integration. Martina Sabra, at least longer term, should we be much more concerned with trying to better integrate mu Muslims in European populations than, than has been the case heretofore. Uh, we often talk about the need to lock up young men who may be wanting to head off to the Middle East to fight. Sherif Kouachi was locked up, and clearly it didn't have the effect people were looking for. I think Do we need several... to try a different approach? And if so, what is it? I think there are several levels. I think we have to sort this out. There are several levels. One level is Islamophobia and the anti-Islamic attitudes. And this is a, a string which right-wing parties are playing on. And this, of course, has an effect, a psychological effect, socio, social and psychological effect. But on the other hand, we now know more about the profiles of those jihadists or these terrorists, these self-radicalized people. Some of them come from middle class backgrounds, but very often they come from middle class backgrounds with very difficult mm. families. Mm. But we now know that 40% of them, there have been recently, studies have been published for the first time about the social profiles and backgrounds of most of these people, of the most violent groups. And those are mostly people who are poor, who come from broke up fa broken families, who have broken biographies. Uh, so there is a certain pattern. And I think we have to face the, the general injustice, which is spreading all over Europe. And this does not only affect these young Muslims. This may affect any young person. And um, some of the converts, I think, some of the conversions which we have, like people who never were actually religious, but they, they suddenly become Muslims and they become more Muslim than the Muslims mm. themselves. Many of them, they, they, they do not become Muslims because they know anything about Islam but they feel that they are being treated um, indecently and unjustly and I think there is in eff effectively injustice. Mm -hmm. The third point I think is prevention mm -hmm. and we have a problem here. I think one point is investigating and giving more financial means, more money to the secret services but we need much more investment in prevention programs and actually there have been shortcomings recently. We have excellent, some excellent um, prevention programs in Germany, which have been formed, which have been modeled, um, 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 well, well um, following a, an earlier pattern, the, like these exit programs which had been developed for the right-wing extremists, the neo-Nazis, have been adapted to Islamists. And we have some excellent programs which are really judged in a very positive way by international experts, but there is, is not enough money. And actually, mm -hmm. financial um, support is being cut. There are cutbacks by the... By, and this should not happen. We have a problem here. So I think it's threefold. It's, yeah. Michel Lidas, you have mentioned several <coughs> times the uh, risk that we may see increasing polarization and radicalization because of the rise of right-wing movements, both uh, in France but, of course, also here in Germany. Would you suppose that in the current climate we will see that kind of a reasoned discussion about increasing programs designed uh, to, at prevention and integration, or um, is there reason to be more pessimistic? Well, I think serious politicians they will go uh, for that path, but there will be other more popular politicians who will try to exploit the general mood and they will join in the ranks of those claiming that Islam in general is a risk for society and they will, you know, add to the problems rather than trying to, to, to solve them. I see a strong polarization in European societies, a polarization which has not so much to do with Islam or not Islam, it's, it's a social issue. We are facing serious problems in Europe in terms of uh, 
will I continue to live my way of life for the next years to come or not? And those who do, do not have a good education, they have good reasons to fear that they are just being kicked out of the economic system, so to speak, that they become poor. And there is a really a strong fear of mainly the small and middle classes of their social downgrading. And for these people, it is a very easy scapegoat to say, uh, well, it's Islam, it's immigrants who are responsible for all our misery and not the globalization or general political uh, problems. These people who demonstrate in Germany against Islam, they would never question any policy making by decision makers in, in Berlin or in Brussels or elsewhere. They only go for Islam. For them, if there were no Muslims in Germany, no problems at all. Every problem is being solved, which is ridiculous when you look at the federal state of Sachsen, the south, southeast of Germany, where this movement, anti-Islam movement, is very strong. They have less than 1% less than 1% of their citizens are of Muslim origin. So it's really you know, a scapegoat they are, they are living on and they seem to need this. And the consequences, they are really dire because in, in most Arab countries, when you look at the uh, Facebook uh, accounts of uh, Al Jazeera or other media outlets in the Arab world, the, the city of Dresden, which is very strong in that context, and this Pegida movement against the Islamization of the, of the Occident, they are known, and uh, no Arab uh, will ever get the idea to go to Dresden, go shopping there, or invest money there. So they are really shooting into their own knees, but they have, don't have the farsightedness to realize this. So Geraldine Schwartz, it sounds to me like uh, what I'm hearing here is that the conflict of cultures that was predicted, I think, almost 15 mm. years ago now, uh, may be occurring not so much between the West and the Middle East or there as well, but also right here within our own societies, within Europe. Yes, um, actually, to, to, to come back to what you said, uh, I, I interviewed a young uh, Islamist in, in Germany and um, Muslims, some were more radical than others. And the less radical said that it's actually a movement. I mean, in the Muslim world, at schools, at university, they see even educated Muslims, they see this radicalization among young Germans and uh, Muslims. Uh, and there is a real separation now in among the young Muslims in Germany between the radicals um, and, and the others. But what they said, these uh, measured Muslims, is that it is actually a problem of youth which wants to radicalize, they want purity, they want something to be uh, perfect. And it could be anything. So now it's religion. But if there wouldn't be the religion, it would be something else. So what I'm hearing is two marginalized groups, one group on the right, people who feel that they are losing out in the modern economy, another group within the migrant community, Muslim background, but not only, who feel that they too have been pushed to the side within our societies. Martina Sabra, looking forward, politically speaking, would you expect to see the threat of right-wing violence. And there have been attacks in France, of course, on Muslim institutions, as well as the kind of attack we're talking about here today. Would you expect to see that rise in future? Yeah, I think we have to get ready for that. And we also have to take measures to secure places of worship, for example. I mean, this is already happening in Sweden, where we would never have ever have expected this to happen. But there has been a rising number of of, of attacks during the last week. So I think this is a sign in many tackle we should, we should read really um, diligently. But on the other hand, I think that it can also lead to a situation where people really stand together, like in my hometown, for example, in Cologne, where one in six um, inhabitants is of, has a Muslim background because um, one, more than 100,000 people are from Turkey and from other countries, um, the right wings didn't, ringers didn't have a chance. I mean, there were demonstrations last week and the right wingers were like 250 and the others were like 15,000. So um, I, I hope that we will be able to, um, to get away from this polarization and take this, this massacre which has happened really as, as a sign and as a motivation to stand together, but I'm not so positive. When we talk about the response to an attack like this, a crucial aspect, of course, is freedom of the press. Let us take a quick look at the newspaper that was targeted in the attacks and what it stood for.
the Charlie Hebdo editorial team, pictured here three years ago. They met each week to plan the next edition, packing it with parodies of the latest news. For five decades, the publication has mocked the highest and mightiest. Nicolas Sarkozy, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, and many others. The Catholic Church has sued Charlie Hebdo 14 times and lost every time. The Council of Muslims in France also tried, unsuccessfully, to stop the reprinting of Danish cartoons of the Prophet Mohammed. A bomb attack wrecked the paper's offices in 2011. This followed threats of violence over one edition which changed the title to Sharia Hebdo, with the Prophet Mohammed pictured on the cover. The following edition was titled Love is Stronger Than Hate, but was still provocative. Michel, there is a very irreverent approach, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, Western democracies hold freedom of expression to be an absolutely central pillar of our societies. But, at least in Germany, there is also, as a very, very central value, the idea of the respect for human dignity. Have we got the right balance between those two values? Well, I think uh, it's difficult to talk about values without taking into uh, account the social realities in a given country because it's these social realities that really define the way in which groups interact with each other. And for the time being, as a result of globalization, as a result of the ongoing crises in various parts of the world, be it in the Middle East, be it towards Russia and Ukraine, I think there are ongoing tensions. There are different groups in, within society who hold different opinions and they are not necessarily used to, you know, fighting it out peacefully. And let us not forget that in Germany in particular, the idea of uh, economic well-being is really one of the cornerstones of German identity. The Germans were very unhappy, many of them, when they lo lost their beloved uh, Mark. And now we have the euro and now we are also facing a, a time of, of serious economic turmoil. Of course, Germany is still very strong compared to other countries in Europe, but still, there are people fearful of losing their social status. And this is the core issue in my opinion. We haven't found the right answers to the questions, how can we deal on a national level with the challenges, with the challenges of globalization? And as long as we do not face these challenges, there will be more and more groups who will fight against other groups within their own society because they believe <clears throat> that they are competitors to their own well-being, so to speak. And immigration is being seen as a threat mainly by the um, smaller uh, income groups. They do not realize that Germany in particular needs immigration in order to uh, keep on living on a rather high level. But our commitment to freedom of expression, do we need to just stay the course, uh, say that a, a paper like Charlie Hebdo must have the right to publish whatever it wants? Yes, absolutely, of course. I mean, there is no discussion about this. Of course, uh, even a satire knows its limits. I mean, uh, certain people in Germany would be very careful to, to draw a caricature on the, on the Pope, for instance, and, and, and on, on Jewish religion, so, there will also not be any jokes. So. Geraldine Schwartz, should the editors at Charlie Hebdo have been more prudent? Should they perhaps have taken some measures, at least after the firebombing in 2011, to uh, accord somewhat more respect to the sensibilities of the Muslim population in France? No. <laughs> no, it would be discriminating. I mean, they are making fun of everybody, the Jews, the Christians, all the politicians. I mean, so it would be actually against their own value to make a difference. And these uh, people are uh, actually living for values um, and for freedom, we, we actually are very, uh, never asked to, to live for. I mean, it's very rare that people are asked to do these sacrifices for uh, the freedom uh, of expression. And also about satire, I think we have to make a difference between now uh, a, a newspaper, normal journalist, and uh, cardinals, because I think cardinals are a bit like artists. It's a, it's a new space, it's another space, and they are actually free to say things, to show things that the journalist can't do, because a journalist has to protect its source, uh, it has to be quite careful with its contacts. So a, a satire, a cardinals, has the freedom a journalist doesn't have. 
Martina uh, Sabra, after, uh, after the Danish cartoons were published and we had a discussion very much like this one, one of the Danish colleagues uh, said after he received death threats that he felt that he and his colleagues had been naive. Would you say that's true here as well? Um, naive would maybe be the wrong word. I think there is a great responsibility because there are so many people around the world who like to use this kind of caricatures for their own political um, aims. And there have been too many people have been killed because uh, other people were inciting violence, allegedly because of cartoons or books like Salman Rushdie, who really suffers until today from the fact that people have died because of his book, allegedly because of his book, but of course not because of his book, because there were people who incited violence. This is it. But I think we really should not mix up things. I think that uh, the freedom of expression is a very is a sacred value, and we should stick to that. And this newspaper, these people, the, this magazine, nobody there did kill anybody. They did not kill. And I, I read yesterday some spontaneous reactions on Twitter and so on. Ah, oh, they should not have done this. I think this is completely. Ill. This is really a sick way of argumenting and we should not fall into this trap. Um, another thing which I find very important also to underline here is that there is a satirical tradition in the Arab cultures as well, and I call them cultures because they are very different from Morocco to Iraq and, uh, and also to the Gulf. And people inside the Arab cultures or inside, in the Arab world have been much harder sometimes in the past. This, these are ideolo ideological movements who claim a, a one Arab culture which does not exist, a, a unified identity which does, has never existed. And also we have to add that those, the victims, most of the victims in numbers today are Muslims of this radicalism. Let us not forget that most of the victims, most of the people who die of this radicalism today are Muslims. Um, of course, this is very symbolic. Um, Europeans are being more and more targeted, but up to today, the, 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 the number of Muslims outnumbers by far the, the number of European victims. Michel Ludas, briefly, if you would, when you speak to your friends and acquaintances in the Middle East, what sense do you get from them about where they would stand on freedom of expression and an attack like this one? Most Arabs that I know, they would be very happy if they enjoyed the same freedom of expression that exists in Europe. So they are striving for the same ideals and they are fighting the same enemies. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us today and thanks to you out there for tuning in. See you soon.